Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 357, Seminary Student Takes Trinity Class, Becomes Unitarian, Part 2. This episode of the Trinity's podcast is a continuation of my wide-ranging conversation with recent seminary graduate Johnny Barnes about his change of mind from Trinitarian to Unitarian. We'll pick it up here where Johnny is offering further advice to those Christians who would fearfully, faithfully, and honestly reopen the issue of whether New Testament teaching is actually Trinitarian. You know, in terms of advice, yeah, resources, praying about it a lot, and and just looking into the other side. So one thing that a lot of friends have done is I'll say, hey, you know, do you mind just like looking into this and, you know, we'll talk about it next time more. Like, I'm not going to just debate people the very first time I tell them, hey, I've become a Unitarian. Let's debate. Like, they just don't, I know that they just, they haven't really looked into it and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And so they'll come back to me the next time and say, well, I researched it and I'm I'm set in stone. You know, I, I believe in Trinitarianism. And I'm like, okay, well, what did you do to research? And they'll say something like, oh, well, you know, I, I looked at one or two Trinitarian articles. I don't want to be rude, but that's truly not research. Like, that's just, that's validating your own opinion. Mm-hmm. And to truly do research, you need to look into the other side and see, okay, what are they, what are their arguments? Yeah. And really, 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 again, I can't emphasize this enough is just trying to be as unbiased as possible. Because there are some things, like again, John 17, 5, I will be as unbiased as possible I can with that and say, if I was to just read John 17, 5, I would probably conclude that Jesus preexisted. You know, I probably would. But there's other scriptures out there that are very clear that Jesus' beginning was when he was born. So, I'm willing to concede that there are some passages that are a little bit vague, and you definitely could take them in a Trinitarian way. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the fear of mine is that many Trinitarians, they give zero leeway. Like, I'll read John 17, 3 to them and say, Jesus himself calls the Father the only true God. Like, please think about that for a second. If Jesus is himself equally God, why would he say, to the only true God, you know, like that's just it at the very least, that's a little bit deceitful. Like at the very least, if he is fully God, if he's, if he's just as much God as the father. Yeah. Why would he say the father is the only true God? I mean, Augustine saw this. This is why he suggests in a couple places that maybe the Arians must've got to this and corrupted it. But interestingly, it's also in John 5, 44, he does the same Mm -hmm. thing. He uses the word only there also in describing the father and you know you see, you know it too, and all the way in Isaiah, you know, God calls Himself the only God. So, like to me, the fact that people don't stumble over these verses tells me that they're not really looking at them. Because when you really look at that, it should make you pause and think, "Wow, like, okay, he, he's literally saying he's the only God." And if I'm a Jew and I'm reading this, I'm not going to think there's some sort of Trinity there. It's just the Father there, and He's calling Himself the only God and the Creator of the heavens and the earth. Yeah, I have a piece of advice to throw into the pot. I think. Yeah. What Trinitarians do by tradition is they focus on what I call the canon within the canon, which is a pretty small subset of texts that they think are just slam dunk supporters of their case. Yes. And they build it all on that. And then, you know, if you really look into it, you find out it's a foundation of sand because a lot of these passages are very problematic or just don't say what they're supposed to say. Yep. But in my experience, proof text wars are pretty futile because any text you can show them that seems like an obvious expression or an obvious assumption of a Unitarian view, they're just going to gleefully interpret it in terms of their presuppositions. So they'll yeah. say like, well, he says the Father is the only true God, but that doesn't mean that no one else is the only true God, because he doesn't say only the Father is the only true God. Yeah. And you're like, really, bro? Like, <laughs> <laughs> only the Father is only true. The only true. Like, that's, you'd have to say that. Like, that's saying the bar pretty high. But yeah. So the problem is that we're both coming at it with prior commitments that yeah. are more foundational in our minds than anything that any of the texts say. 
Yeah. And so, of course, they're going to read it in light of those, and we're going to read it in light of ours. It's kind of a trivial point, right? It's just what human beings do. Mm -hmm. When you hear some information, you have to interpret it in light of what you already think that you know. So, yeah. The way forward, I think, is to go kind of hypothetical. Like, okay, I understand you think that, you know, the only explanation for this is that, you know, these authors are alternatarians or trying mm -hmm. to be or something like that. Another explanation is no, this is an expression of a Unitarian view. But there's a lot of facts about the New Testament such that they are really surprising if the authors are Trinitarians and they're not surprising if they're Unitarians. Oh, yeah. And so you just start piling these up and it starts to look like really strong evidence. Right? Yep. We already mentioned one is that there's no Trinity passage. You would totally expect there to be one. Yep. It's Protestant. You believe in the sufficiency of Scripture to teach us everything that we need to know to be Christians. So there's just got to be like a fairly clear Trinity passage, right? Just like there is for the resurrection or Jesus being the Messiah or his yep. crucifixion, his atonement, stuff like that. What's the chance of that if they're all really Trinitarians? Like, why would they all blow it like that? It's like, <laughs> it's weird, right? It's, it's improbable. You know, if they're Unitarians, okay, well, they just don't think that at all. So that's why it's not there. Yep. Um, another one is just that they don't have any word, not just the word Trinity, they don't have any word that at the time meant a triune God or was used to refer to a triune God. Mm -hmm. right, so later on, like the time of Augustine, the word God is precisely the word that I'm asking for. God could mean the Trinity. It's all over Augustine's writings, right? Yeah. Of course, it was a new usage. It wasn't around in the first century. Yeah. It wasn't even around the second or third century, as far as I can tell, unless you count the modalists, but you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, like what's the chance they don't have any word to refer to this triune God that they all supposedly believe in? It seems like it's really surprising if they're Trinitarians, and it's not surprising if they're Unitarians. Yeah, so absolutely. There's a whole bunch yeah. of these. I mean, I've, I've oh, got yeah. to about 19 or 20 of them. But notice that you can't be accused of begging the question, you know, assuming the very pointed issue, because let's look at it under your assumptions. Now let's look at it under my assumptions, which does it really seem to confirm, if, if either. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great tactic. And there's so many passages we could go to for that. But It's like arguing with a, a Catholic about the papacy or transubstantiation. I mean, they have their proof texts. You're not yep. going to pry those out of their cold, dead fingers. They're never going to let go of those. So any kind of frontal assault is just, it's going to backfire, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think it's a little bit, it's healthy to challenge them, but yes, I, I totally agree. You, you know, I think one of the huge ones too, and I think something that I think Trinitarians misunderstood about, and I misunderstood, is we see all these arguments for Jesus being God, and then we think, boom, Trinity. Like we, mm. we really make that leap. Like, those are the main proof texts are really Jesus being God. You have literally one verse that some Trinitarians use in Acts, mm -hmm. you know, about, you know, the blood of his own versus his own blood. Mm -hmm. But there's very, very, very little <laughs> evidence that the Spirit is some separate person. And I think that's a great argument you could use with the Spirit. Because, you know, in Trinitarianism, the idea is that the Spirit is a separate person who is equally God. And who has to be equally worshipped. Yeah, who has to be equally worshipped. So, yeah, yeah, so some of these questions of these hypothetical questions of well why do we never once see an explanation or or a command to worship the spirit if he is equally god and equal in glory he deserves just as much glory as the father but yet all throughout the new testament you see jesus doing things and the apostles doing things what to the glory of god the father not to the glory of the holy spirit yeah he's never worshiped never prayed to yeah, never worship, never prayed to, and no never personal name. Never a conversation with mm -hmm. the Spirit. To me, mm -hmm. that is a super powerful point. The Trinitarians would say a Spirit is a separate person. Mm -hmm. There's not one explanation in the entire Bible or one verse that talks about the Spirit having a conversation with somebody, or Jesus having a conversation with the Spirit. Yeah. Or the Father having a conversation with the Spirit. So like mm -hmm. where are we getting this idea that he's a separate has a separate personality from the Father? That is just baffling to me. And when you really think I think that's a very, very weak point of Trinitarianism.
There's another hypothetical way to proceed that I have thought of, but I haven't really developed in my work yet. But it's something like, what would it take to persuade you to switch your view? Yeah. I don't know what they would say. I think I know what I would say. Like, I would like to see this triune God referred to as such, not just via the parts, but I'd like to see a reference to the whole. Yep. I'd like to see some warning, you know, when when all these apparent limits are stated about Jesus, I'd like to see some warning to the effect of, but you know, but don't think he's not fully divine because he only has these limits with respect to his human nature or something like that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Probably equal worship. I'd like to see the word God spread around a whole lot more. Things like that. I'm not sure what they would say. It'd be interesting because, I mean, you could say, well, look, if he says the Father's the only true God, like... What more would you need than that? <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I said to my friend. I said literally, like, how much more clear would you want him to say it? If Unitarianism was true, how much more clear could he say it? Like, I, I'm I truly I can't think of any words that would be actually much clearer than just saying he's the only true God. I mean, the word only, mm-hmm. the word true. I don't know. Clearly, he's distinguishing himself from the Father there. And he's because he says, you know, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. So I just, I don't know how much more clear he could be. It'd be interesting to what a Trinitarian would say to an answer to that, because I think some of the stuff they would come up with would be obviously wrong headed. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, I want to see Jesus never worshiped or never honored or anything like that. Well, it says yeah. it's to the glory of God. And, you know, has God <laughs> yeah. exalting him in Revelation 5. So are you sure, like, you really want to hold out for that one? That's a question I've gotten also multiple times is, you know, why is Jesus worshipped? You know, and it, it is a valid question. Sure. But, you know, when I looked at the two, there's only really two passages that explain why he's worshipped. Mm-hmm. And you have it in Philippians 2, you know, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is God. Oh, no, that's not what it says. Mm-hmm. Is Lord. So, you know, that's a reason there. Why is every tongue confessing well, that he's Lord, and I think it goes on to say that God raised him from the dead. Um, I can't really remember off the top of my head. But anyways, and then you have Revelation 5, and you're exactly right. He's worshipped, but he's worshipped as the Messiah to the glory of God the Father. Yeah, on the basis of his service to God, bringing all people from all nations to God, basically. Yeah, mm-hmm. not because he's God. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's pretty clear why he's being worshipped there. And so... You know, we import this idea of worship, therefore he's God. It's like, whoa, 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 let's tap the brakes. Why is he being worshipped? And it's clearly, you know, because he's the Messiah, he's the king. I would like to get three Trinitarian friends in a room and say, okay, give me what it would take to convince you. You guys discuss it. Give me, I don't know, five points or something. Yeah. See what they would come up with. And I have a feeling some of it we'd shoot down using scripture, you know, like, I don't think Jesus should ever be called God. Okay, well, Jesus says in John 10 that those to whom the word of God came can be referred to as gods. So yep. that seems like a little bit too much to require. Go back to the drawing board. Okay. I really don't know what they'd come up with, but if we don't know, like in science, when you have competing hypotheses, I think you do have an idea what it would take to falsify the one and leave the other one standing. Yep. You know, it's something empirical, so that makes it easier. But Okay, it's not going to be anything empirical, I don't think. But yeah, what is it? Because if it, if we can't say that, then are we just like slapping each other or like playing this stupid game to <laughs> aggravate each other? Like, Yeah, it's it's literally, I mean, yeah, it's, it becomes an unfalsifiable position. Um, you literally can't, I mean... It's, a, it's yeah, you, arguments a game. There has to be a way to win it in a sense. That's one way to put it. Yeah, exactly. So... I mean, you can say something really abstract, like, uh, I would be convinced if I thought a Unitarian view was overall the best explanation of the text. Something. I, I, it's like, what does that really answer. mean? Yeah. It's like, what does that really mean, though? Yeah. That's a good answer, but then it's hard to, it's hard to know when you've made any progress towards that. So, yeah, what would that look like if that turned out to be the best explanation? When the Trinity's podcast returns... Mr. Barnes and I discuss the importance of what isn't in the New Testament when it comes to judging between a Trinitarian interpretation of those writings and a Unitarian interpretation of those writings.
since the Holy Spirit being a separate person, equal with the Father and equal with the Son, is such a weak point in Scripture, I wonder if that's a point that we should focus on more in debates or just in, you know, friendly dialogues with people, is just getting them to see, like, you know, the Trinity is not just that Jesus is God. You know, let's let's yeah. really try to see here, where are you getting this idea that the Spirit is the separate person who deserves equal glory? Like, where? Because there's just a, a vacuum of text. There's nothing there. That's what I don't understand. How do you get them to see the evidential importance of what's not there? Right. Everybody's yes. fixated on what is there. Okay. You know, he's called the comforter and the advocate here and the helper. Yep. Ananias and Sapphira lied to the spirit. So clearly, if you can lie to him, he must be a person. Like they know, like all the stock off the shelf arguments, but they don't see the relevance of like the blazing absences. Yeah. One point I make to people about the spirit is that Gregory of Nazianzus and his theological orations from the year 380 just straight up admits that, hey, we're all still arguing about this spirit. What's the deal with this? Which is really, <laughs> you know, kind of shocking because, you know, the next year they turn around and I think implicitly, they're not very clear about it, but I think they implicitly promote the Holy Spirit as being the same essence as the Father and the Son. Yeah. But he just admits that, hey, Christians disagree about this. Well, of course they do. Like, yeah. Yeah. You've had plenty of Unitarians who think that the Spirit's like the third greatest being. It's some kind yeah. of created angel type thing or something that does these personal things, but it's, they don't think it's equally divine with the Father. Yeah. I think that's, those are all great points. I think the Spirit is, is very absent. The Trinitarian understanding of the Spirit is very absent from the scriptures. And real fast, let me mention the BU. Uh, so on that page, actually, on the YBU page on biblicalunitarianism.com, mm -hmm. I had just added, I think it's under like point number one or point number two, things that are absent from the scriptures that you've been taught. <laughs> so this is really relevant for me. Mm. It's like five or six quick bullet points. It's literally just things that aren't in scripture, you know, verses that aren't there that we think are there. Generation and procession, anybody? <laughs> Is that on the list? I do talk about eternal begottenness. Yeah. How that's not a biblical concept. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so just mention, I just mentioned, you know, God has never once called three, three and one. You don't have to use the word Trinity, but just the word three. You know, there's a word for three in Greek. We know, like, mm -hmm. it's not that they didn't have the word for it. So there's no tri aspect to God at all mentioned in scripture. There's no two natures of Jesus. There's no two anything. There's no two minds. There's no two wills. God, so these man. are just things that are like surprisingly absent that, you know, Trinitarians would say these are essential to salvation, but they're just absent from the scripture. So it's like, mm -hmm. you know, after you start getting to the fifth bullet point, like, wait a second, like this seems pretty contrived. I feel like Protestants will focus and, and we will do it as well, you know, focus on one verse just in a crazy way almost like this is just the slightest mention of you know the spirit maybe proceeding from the sun and it's like we just make we exploded into this whole thing mm -hmm. and you know the eastern and western catholic church divides it's kind of a dividing point between protestants who really are like bible only and protestants who really seem to think that you have to agree with at least the first four ecumenical councils like the yeah. first kind of Protestants, half of them will tell you like, nah, there's no generation of procession. That's just, it's purely a later concern. It's just not there at all. Yeah. It's kind of eternal emanation or causation. The father's bringing these other divine persons into existence. Like the time of origin, it goes back that far. Maybe it's an Irenaeus. He's unclear. And before that, you had people who just didn't buy Logos theory at all, or you had people like Justin who thought that God emanated out the Logos at just the right time when it was time to create. Tertullian's the same way, right? No eternal generation there, but there's yep. some, some kind of causation. But anyway, it's just not in Scripture. If you want to base everything on Scripture, you should maybe just let those go. You know, something interesting real fast so I'll mention about my last semester in seminary went through Catherine Sonderegger's systematic theology, and it was just so theoretical and philosophical that there's not necessarily a problem with that, but she's calling it a systematic theology. Mm -hmm. She would spend like a whole passage on Exodus talking about the burning bush and how that represents God and how God is the light who's invisible. And, it, you know, I, I call her the paradox theologian, but anyways, mm -hmm. 
I think I see in her this idea that, and, and even my professor mentioned it, that like we basically move beyond the basics. It's like, okay, you know, we have the Wayne Grudem's, we already have his systematic theology. That's the basics. Let's get into the real meat. But the interesting thing there is like, they've actually gotten the basics wrong, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really matter because they're focusing on what they call the meat. And mm -hmm. so like, I've noticed it's really interesting. Like, why don't more people become biblical Unitarian? I think it's because even the scholars, they're not focused on the Unitarian versus Trinitarian debate. That's not even a question. No. They accept Trinitarianism as true. Now they're concerned with, okay, how do we understand all these different philosophies and understandings of the Spirit and the Son and the Father? They think it shouldn't be debated because you'd just be giving your precious platform to these horrible heretics and then people would get confused. So Exactly. Weirdly, there's this authoritarian attitude that prevails. From a philosopher's perspective, this speculation is really undisciplined and honestly kind of boring. It's philosophical speculation, but it's not good philosophical speculation. Yeah, that's what I found. I'm like, I, I enjoy reading philosophy sometimes, but I, I just did not enjoy reading it too much because she would just make claims and it's just like, okay, cool. Like, there's no way to really check your claim. I mean, you're just kind of, you're saying something that we don't really have any way to validate or invalidate. It's like, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe that's true. Yeah, Trinity speculations are kind of a play thing. They're treated that way. It's odd. So anyways, I think the whole idea there is that a lot of the scholars and the top people in seminaries are missing the forest through the trees. And they're just, they're so focused on these specific Trinity theories and kenosis and all this stuff. And it's like, wait a second, we haven't even really, really evaluated, is this theory even valid before we start speculating how to make it valid? So anyways, I just found that like really interesting that there's a reason why so many people aren't even questioning it is because it's not, they just, they would literally say that like that question is beneath them. Like that's, yeah. we've already figured that yeah. out a long time ago. When the Trinity's podcast returns, I ask Mr. Barnes if in seminary, he learned about the historical development of Trinity and incarnation theories in the first six or seven Christian centuries. TS question. Did they teach you about the history of kind of the evolution of mainstream speculations about God and the Logos and the Spirit and so on? Or did they do the more James White kind of approach, which is, you know, find some quotations of guys in the 100s that refer to <laughs> Jesus as God and then yeah. sort of spike the ball? Like, yeah, we've always all been Trinitarian. Look, because yep. Ignatius calls Jesus God. And yeah. just kind of move on from there. Like, do they actually like tell you like how origin is different than Justin and how, uh, <laughs> you know, there was a backlash against Logos theories and these were perceived as new and unbiblical. And so there were all this opposition among ordinary people. Like, did they get into this kind of stuff? No. And that's a great question. And again, this idea that people think, oh, well, you know, my pastor must be right because he's been taught by somebody who's been taught. And it's just, you haven't sat in the seminary classes I've sat in. Like I, I know what they're being taught, and you're exactly right. It's the James White. Let's pull out a few quotes from. That's that's exactly. You literally hit the nail on the head. No, they just pulled out a few depressing. quotes. <laughs> um, that was one of the things on my journey to becoming a biblical Unitarian. Is I would listen to Sean Finnegan, and a little bit of your understanding of church history. And I was like, this is not what they're telling me at all. And then I would go read these guys for myself and be like, oh, wait, yeah, they don't have that understanding of the Trinity. Like, yeah, there's this quote that they might seem to call him God. And honestly, I, I have an interesting point about Ignatius. Mm -hmm. Ignatius is one of the only early church fathers to keep calling Jesus God directly. Never mind that his works are super corrupted. 
Yes. So, you know, he has the <laughs> short version, the middle version, or the short recension, the middle recension, and the long recension. And in my apostolic father's class, he was talking through and he's just like, you know, the middle recension is clearly the right one. You know, every scholar agrees on that. And I was like, that's so strange because almost always in other documents that we find, we would usually say the shortest recension is the best. And then, you know, later on, scribes added more and more to it. Yeah. So well, interestingly, I went and looked at the short recension of Ignatius versus the middle. And what do you know, in the shorter recension, all the God passages aren't there. And so the likelihood that, and I think that was in like Alexandria maybe is where the shorter recension was found. I don't really remember. I think the mainstream view is that it's like a Syriac paraphrase of the middle recension. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. It might be Syriac. Someone's yeah. kind of like trying to summarize it or something. But look, even if the mainstreamers are right that the middle recension is the most genuine out of the three, that doesn't tell you that the middle recension isn't riddled with corruptions. Yeah. Because even yeah. the guy Lightfoot, big 19th century scholar that put the mainstream on this course of thinking the middle recension is genuine. Yep. He thinks that it has been larded with extra God references in the yeah. middle recension. Yeah. So I just I just found that really interesting. Yeah. I'm like, you know, what are the chances that they're not trying to really fight against Trinitarianism? You wouldn't think in, you know, in Syriac in the first or second century. So they're not trying to take out God passages. It seems to me much more likely that they just that was like their version. And then somebody later in added all of these God passages. So I just found that really interesting. It became a theological football early. So it, who knows when it started being corrupted? Yeah, exactly. And there are still scholars you can find that only think a couple of them are genuine and the rest of them are made up. And keep in mind that the Miller recension, all these texts, I think it's like one or two copies and they all have the fake letters in the same copies, right? So you know everything's been in the forger's hands. Yes. Everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. That's a really great point. Yeah. Um, anyway, what happened with me, I was blessed in that in philosophy, getting three degrees in that, I was taught to read historical philosophers. Mm -hmm. So I would go back and read people like Origen, Tertullian, and so on, and be able to understand them in their own context and realize that they're different than the other guys. The big smoking gun that anybody could find is if you read Novation. It's easiest to read Novation because he wrote like one main work on the Trinity. Okay. But almost equally in Tertullian and in many places in Origen, they're really concerned to refute these two different heretics that they think are wrong and out of balance. And it's the modalists and it's the biblical Unitarians. It's what historians call dynamic monarchians mm -hmm. or the mere man view. So here we are in the middle of the 200s and there's all this backlash against Logos theory, which tells you that it was new and it was unpopular. And they tell us that the common people, as opposed to the very, you know, kind of more Hellenized scholars, yeah, they tend to reject Logos theory. We don't believe in two creators and two gods. We believe in one creator and one God, just like the Bible says, just like the creed says. Yeah. So just the fact that in mainstream Christianity, right, not Gnostics, these Logos theorists are constantly battling modalists and mere manists just tells you that, no, not everybody was a Trinitarian back then. In fact, nobody was. <laughs> yeah, that was just baffling to me too. Yeah, so anyways, yeah, in my time at, at DTS, that's what church history was. Or, you know, that's what my Trinity class was. Church history was another, you know, that's, he, he they didn't spend too much time on um, some of that stuff. A lot of it was honestly pretty recent church history. Hmm. Now, 20 centuries is a lot to cover in one semester. Yeah, so... But yes, in the Trinity class, it was literally just, you know, cut, cut and paste some quotes from early church fathers, which, wow, I, that was just mind blowing to me. I was like, wow, y'all are really just reframing this. And again, the, the common thing that they would say is, oh, well, they just didn't have the words to, to properly articulate the Trinity. Mm -hmm. You know, as well as I do, that's just kind of bogus. It's kind of patronizing. Like, why would they be so poor at coining words? It's just so funny, too, because to make that claim is so interesting because their claim is not that the Trinity developed in the third or fourth century. They would want to claim that the Trinity is a New Testament teaching. Right. So it's like, if you believe that, then why are you saying they didn't really have the words then? Like, which is it? You know, is it a, is it a New Testament teaching or is it a, a third or fourth century development? Mm-hmm. 
When the Trendies podcast returns, the exciting translation project Mr. Barnes is working on now. So when we met at the Unitarian Christian Alliance Conference, I was excited to learn that now you're working with the ministry Spirit and Truth on the REV Bible. So why don't you tell us what that project is? Yeah, so it's the Revised English Version. It's a Biblically Unitarian Bible translation. So originally, John Shane Hyatt was creating this project, you know, 20, 25 years ago, saying, hey, we want people to have a Bible that they can read that's not Trinitarian bias. And and before you think, well, how could that really be? They're probably just really translating it. No, again, in my studies, I found that, I mean, almost all of them, legitimately, almost all of the major Trinitarian texts either have textual or other problems with them that you would say, man, that's not very clear. Mm-hmm. So the classic example I use is John 1.18. Um, you have only begotten God and only begotten Son, and about half the manuscripts are one. I think half the manuscripts say the other. I believe it's only the Alexandrian tradition that talks about only begotten God uh, or that uses only begotten God. Mm-hmm. So there's different textual traditions and all that stuff, but we don't need to get into that. Anyways, so Trinitarians will translate that only begotten God, Right. You know, why not? They they believe in the Trinity. This is a text that supports their view. I don't blame them for it at all. Well, and they wouldn't apply the rule that the more difficult reading is to be preferred, even if it totally sounds like something John would never say. Yes. Yeah. And that's what's really, yeah, the, that's a really interesting rule in textual, textual criticism that I was taught. The most difficult reading is to be preferred which is really interesting because you're basically saying ignore the internal considerations and just take the harder reading. But it's like, wait a second, John three different times, you know, uses the phrase only begotten son. So wouldn't we expect him to use only begotten son here? So so to me, that's a a really strong argument. It's odd that you should consider the context of the book and the author when interpreting, but now when it comes to textual considerations, suddenly this is off the table. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The more honest translations, they will put a footnote that says, well, you know, some manuscripts have only begotten son. Yep. And we we do that for, you know, there's there's some problem passages that it really is unclear and we will put footnotes. So really, I think we we try to do as good of a job as we can with being unbiased and just saying, hey, look, this is what the evidence shows. This is what we've seen from the context. You know, this is the reading we think makes a lot of sense. And, you know, theology really does affect translation. People think the NASB is unbiased or the KJV is perfect because, you know, it came down from God. <laughs> uh, we, we know that that's not true, obviously, about the KJV. Mm-hmm. Even Protestants, serious scholars, there's nobody that really believes that. But, yeah, in terms of the NASB being literal, you know, I'm working through almost every day comparing different translations. And I'm looking at how the NASB translates certain things They're definitely not literal. Like, there's definitely points where you can't be literal. You know, you'll have a string of nouns put together. You have to figure out, you know, where do we put in an is? You know, there's going to be, there's got to be an is in here somewhere. Mm Translation is not just this perfectly easy process, especially when you're going from a language like Greek or Hebrew to English. They're just very, very different languages. So it's not like going from, Spanish to English, or, you know, there's a lot of words that are the same, and a lot of the ideas are the same, and verbs kind of work the same. They're just very different languages. So you're going to have some translation considerations. So all that to say, John Shane Height kind of started this project with his intention of of trying to have a Bible that wasn't really biased. I know that's a crazy claim, and we we know that we're not perfect, and we know that, you know, there's no such thing as a perfectly unbiased translation. But that's our goal, and and we're trying to produce a translation that's very readable, but also faithful. And so people will say, well, you know, a literal translation is the best. 
Well, not necessarily. There's definitely moments where the literal would actually get you to miss the meaning. Uh, there's there's mm-hmm. many, many times yep. where an English reader would read it and not actually pick up what they're actually trying to say. I think people that only know one language or who haven't done translating, they sort of, maybe interlinears give people this idea too, that translating is just kind of matching up the different words and there yeah. you go. Like here, I'll just substitute English words for Greek words. Yep. They don't realize that there is always a little bit of interpretation that comes into translation. Exactly. But then, with your Trinitarian presuppositions, even if you're honest, you're going to get it wrong because yes, you're bringing these fourth century ideas back into older materials. Yeah. So, so you know, he started that project, and and we've been working on that for 25 years, I guess. Different people have come on and off uh, working on the project. Right now, we have probably about 40 percent of the New Testament completely translated, and probably about 30 percent of the Old Testament. But the rest of that has been read and looked over. It just hasn't been fully translated. So yeah, he started with I think it was the American Standard Version. Yes, Is that right. Yeah, so, so a version in the lineage of the King James and the Revised Standard, exactly, which was public domain. So yeah, I mean, why translate every single last little like genealogical passage or whatever before you? So you're revising in midstream, starting with that, which is a totally sensible thing to do. What I like about it is I think the notes really respect the reader. They're not afraid to mention different interpretations and different kinds of difficulties. And there is an editorial standpoint that it is a biblical Unitarian translation. But I don't know, I just never feel like they're just giving me pat answers or trying to like protect me from certain information. It really helps me to dig in. I would recommend it to any Unitarian and even to any Trinitarian that wants to know what biblical Unitarians think. Yep, absolutely. And yeah, we're, I mean, we're literally updating it every day. We're adding things to the commentary, and it's really more of a study notes, you might say. It's like an online study Bible, basically, with an app, yeah, phone app. Yeah, and we have, we have a phone app, um, and there's some really cool things you can do. You can highlight verses, you can write as many notes as you want on each verse. So I do that. I use it all the time. On John 1, 1 through 10, I probably have like 40 pages of notes on like different verses and, you know, like it's really cool Like, because in a normal printed Bible, you only have so much space to write on the side. If you have something you really want to say about, you know, you're like, oh, I really want to remember that about this verse. But, you know, in our app, it's really cool. And, and online, you can write as many notes as you want. And we have that commentary there. And honestly, almost about half the verses have some sort of commentary on them. So I think it's a really cool project, but we're shooting to be done with it in about 10 years um, in terms of just we'll have the complete Bible translated. But, it you know, it takes however long it takes. It's It's been really good. So I'd love to see a big, hefty study Bible version of it one day when it's all done. But in the meantime, I think it's a really great resource. Like I said, I use it on my Android phone. I use it online. I've found it helpful. I don't know of a really comparable source. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, we're, we're trying to gear it towards, you know, something that maybe the church can't do. So our ministry, you know, we're saying, wow, we have this opportunity to create a translation and, and a resource for somebody that, you know, maybe they wouldn't have. You know, If you're just a biblical Unitarian sitting at home, you've never been to seminary, you know, you, you've been reading the ESV your whole life. Yeah, like this should be a really, really cool resource for you to see, oh, wow, like, and please don't just read the REV. Like, read the REV and then and compare it with other translations. I think you'll find in a lot of places, like, oh, wow, that makes a lot more sense. Or, oh, I, I see why they did that there. They made that choice. Because um, usually we'll explain choices that we make in terms of tough translation choices. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll explain it, which almost no translation does besides, you know, the NET. That, to me, is a like enormously valuable resource to say, wow, they're telling us why they translated it this way. I use the NET. I like it. You know, sometimes it's spectacularly biased, like when Sharp's rule comes up. But um, I I just about dropped the book on the floor when I read those couple of notes. But um, (laughs) generally, I mean, it's great. It's telling you about how all the difficulties the translator is facing. Yep, It's a good one to compare, I would say. You know, the REV tries to do that as well. So we're we're trying Mm -hmm. to, you know, give you explanations for why we translate. And again, it's not all about Unitarianism. You know, that's not the whole Bible. There's so many other topics and discussions that I think we we do a really good job of. When the Trinity's podcast returns, we offer some advice and even a challenge to current seminary students. 
You know, before I mentioned the fact that according to, I think, today's evangelical seminary professors, our view just is something that literally should not be talked about, much less debated, I would be happy if just your general seminary student actually studied some of today's biblical Unitarian material and at least understood that this is a perspective that Bible-oriented Protestants can come to. If you can understand Molinism, open theism, simple foreknowledge, Calvinism, Arminianism, why can't you understand this? It's yep. really not that hard. It's also not as culty and not as weird or kind of philosophy driven as you think. Again, this is like a standard, you know, we're rationalists. We don't we don't like things we can't fully understand. And I think Cardinal Newman popularized the accusation in the 1800s that somehow this is like philosophy driven, right? That I'm trained in philosophy triggers people like crazy that are into apologetics. <laughs> but yeah. um, then they actually, you know, try to find like the, what the trainings helped me do is actually to stay away from controversial philosophical theses, which is not what systematic theologians do. But anyway, you know, where's the philosophy in Johnny Barnes's uh, change of mind here? Like, where, where yeah. is it? Like, where's the point where he's like, oh, yeah, I got this real highfalutin $3 word theory here. And now I can't be a Trinitarian anymore. Yep. Or it's just, just not there. Like, it doesn't fit the script. So I can probably give a big speech about why my friend who's an evangelical believes in the Trinity. Like I know all the speeches I, I can tell you they can't do that for our side. Yep. I would love it if all the seminary students would go out and read the REV and its notes and say, Hey, I'm going to refute this in my term paper. Yeah. Go do that. And then at least maybe you'll refute it or at least you'll understand where this gang of Bible oriented Protestants are coming from. Yep. That's all we are. We're just like radical Reformation Protestants that took things farther than, you know, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli did. Yep. I would also add on to that. If you're a seminary student, you know, listening to this, please don't think that you're above looking into certain doctrines or that like, you know, the church already solved that a long time ago. That's a dangerous place to be because that's what the Catholic Church said for thousands of years. Well, we already solved that. We don't. We don't need mm -hmm. to talk about that anymore. Mm -hmm. So please, just consider like, hey, maybe I will look into. It. I'll give it some time. You know, I don't have to change my mind. I'm not saying you have to change your mind, but just please give it a chance to look into it. So I, I would just encourage you to do that. How could God let the church go so wrong on such an important thing? I don't know. I mean, but consider the one bishop system. Yep. You're Southern Baptist. I was from a different, you could say, low church tradition, Protestant. We've never lived under bishops a day of our lives. Yep. <laughs> now, this is unthinkable in like the 1400s. It's unthinkable in the 10 hundreds, in the 9 hundreds, in the 5 hundreds. So, yep. why did God allow the mainstream to go so wrong? We think we know bishop Christians who believe in congregational church government or some kind of other church government, like a Presbyterian scheme. Yeah. Why do you allow it to go so wrong on something so central? I don't know. He lets us mess things up, you know, <laughs> but that doesn't mean we can't correct the course. Yep, exactly. And I think I want to say too, as an encouragement, I think the availability of the internet and to hear voices from the other side is just a huge, huge blessing that I think will honestly grow our movement mm -hmm. because, you know, before this, you know, like Church history was not favorable at all. Books were burned, people were killed, people were cast out. So we live at a really cool time in history where people actually can hear the other side. My favorite tragedy in church history is, uh, I think it was in the 360s, there was this bishop of Sirmium named Photinus. And Photinus, according to the reports that we have, was a mere man guy. 
In other words, he believed that Jesus was human and not divine. Mm -hmm. And uh, what the going concern was at the time was like an origin style of Logos theory. So, of course, there was a Nicene movement going on, too, that was still in the middle of the Nicene controversy. So mm -hmm. they they said, "Hey, we're going to refute this this jive turkey." And they, they <laughs> held a uh, they they held a council in his city. All the bishops got together, at least Eastern bishops got together, and they brought their champion dude in to refute him. And the whole debate was taken down in shorthand by professional stenographers. And supposedly afterwards, Photonus went around telling everybody that he won the debate and showed the record to everybody he could. Mm -hmm. This is lost. We don't have it. Yeah. Oh. I know, this was but... still a live question at that time? It was. Yep. And, and they couldn't just uh, fire him because presumably the majority or at least a strong minority of Christians under his leadership as bishop must have agreed with him. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, winners write the history, as they say. Yes, yes, exactly. So, but hopefully that's encouraging and, and you know, we can band together, you know, as as biblical Unitarians and really try to be patient with people and um, discuss with people. So, Well, I really appreciate, Johnny, hearing your story, and I'll pray that God will guide you in your church life and, uh, you know, whatever happens with your degree and uh, yeah. bless you in your work and, you know, where you choose to go in life after this. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much for talking with us. All right. Thank you very much. This week's thinking music has been the track La Bella by Mr. Smith. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. If you love the Trinities podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook. And help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities Podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.